Okay, so next presentation, uh, I would like to introduce Gavin Milner of Scott Partners to help explain the financial obligations for members of owners' corporations. Scott Partners have been helping people reach their financial goals for over 50 years. They are equipped to provide comprehensive expert advice on all compliance-based financial matters and have extensive experience in owners' corporation accounting. Please join me in welcoming Gavin. Good evening, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to just take a moment to thank Gregor, Robert, Joyce, and the whole team at the Knights for their kind invitation. They are actually, we, we work with a number of OC managers, owners corporation managers, and they are fantastic professional, and we are delighted to work with you. So thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> Having said that, accounting tax audit. It's not everyone's cup of tea. It's very dry. Accounting and numbers might be my thing, but it's important for everyone in the room to understand the accounting, the tax, the audit, the, the number side of, of, of the owner's corporation. The reason why, the night handle it for you. They do a lot of work in this. They liaise with us, they li liaise with other auditors and accountants. But they put a lot of work in and people should appreciate the level of work that is required. So, a simple joke about accountants to start off with. There's a, there's a job interview where the business owner asks a simple question, what's two plus two? So the engineer pulls out his ruler, announces somewhere between 3.98 and 4.02. The mathematician, he says, in two hours, I can demonstrate it equals four. He has a whole long proof to, to prove it. The social worker, I don't know the answer, but I'm glad we discussed this important question. <laughs> the lawyer, he would respond, in the case of Mr. Sparkle versus the ATO, the court ruled that two plus two equals five. And what do we, we do? Us tax accountants, we look around, we check no one's listening, we lean across and whisper, we'll do. What do you want it to be? <laughs> We try to make things as easy as possible, obviously within the laws, but we, we try to work with our clients and with the buildings, for instance. Having said that, if you think about an auditor who's different from us accountants, they would just say four. It's always going to be four for an auditor. So what is accounting? Why is it important? Oh, sorry. Why is it important? So everyone knows broadly what accounting is. It's the system of recording your deposits, your expenditure, your assets, your liabilities. And using that data to collect the, to collect the important reports that an OC produces at the, end of, at the end of the year for the owners. These reports include the profit and loss statement, what is your income, what is your expenses? The balance sheet, what assets and what liabilities do you have? And often the cash flow statement. For example, what is the movement in the bank balance and why did it move during the year? So why is this important? It highlights to owners where their levies have been spent or how the balance of reserves has changed during the year. It ensures that there's, there's some sort of accountability and some sort of management. So owners should want to know this. And it's important that, that, they, that, they, that they review this. They're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the OC. And these reports are a summary so that they can fully understand what, what has been happening. So having accurate accounting is the first step in being able to record the performance of the owner's corporation and also to plan for the future. So as you would know, the Owner's Corporation Act 2006 requires, requires many things, but broadly from our perspective, the owner's corporation to keep proper accounting records, recording all income assets, liabilities and expenses, section 33.1 if you're interested, I suspect you're not. <laughs> maintain a separate set of accounts for the approved maintenance plan and also to prepare an annual set of financial statements to, present, to be presented at the AGM. So with so many accountants out there, all of whom do things a little bit differently, we like to be consistent, but there is a lack of consistency. There's, the financial reports aren't subject to the Australian accounting standards, which is just as well because otherwise your fees would 
skyrocket. A lot higher. Those are, those are public companies. So they general purpose reports, which means that the auditor or the one preparing it has to explain how they're presented so that the users can understand. So there's a potential for differences in classifications and interpretations, and this can co cause confusions for members, especially when there's a change of owner's corporation manager, change of owners, change of accounting, accountant or auditor. Most financial statements follow a similar format, which includes the notes. And this is where it spouts out exactly how things are analysed and how things have been recorded. One of those is the cash versus accrual, which, which is, a, which is an, a regular question that we get. What, what is cash and what is accrual? So cash accounting records income and expenses at the time the receipt or payment is actually made. Accrual accounting records income and expenditure when it is incurred. So for income, when the, when the fee becomes due from the owner, not when it is received. So for example, you issue me with an invoice to pay in June. I take my time, I pay in August. So if we're using accruals, we'll only record the transaction in June. If we're using cash, we record it in August. So OC, OC should always prepare their annual financial statements on an accruals accounting method. It's more accurate and it records all transactions and invoices. Budgeting. So the purpose of any budget is, is to ascertain the specific costs of the next reporting period and how these will be funded. Each property will have a different budget as each has different needs. This depends on the, what assets the building has or how many services are required. The budget then determines the, le the level of levies for the upcoming period, so it is important the budget is carefully considered and reviewed on an ongoing basis. The format of the financial reporting for owners' corporations requires that the budget figures are included in the annual set of financial statements, allowing owners to review these costs in line with what was actually spent. So, income tax. So there's a number of different areas of income tax. The first one we'll talk about is GST. So, everyone knows what GST is. It applies generally when a business or organisation has over $75,000 of income in the financial year. If so, it must register for GST. However, it's not practical for owners' corporations, especially medium-sized ones, who have to take on this extra burden if that was the case. So for owners' corporations, the annual, annual levy is $150,000. So if there is an anticipation that levies will reach $150,000, or they actually do exceed $150,000, they are required to register for GST and charge GST on the levies to the, to the owners. If that is the case, then the property will need to acquire an ABN. It prepares quarterly BASAs, business activity statements. It has to remit GST to the tax office, but it also gets a credit for GST on the expenditure. This is an added burden for the, for the owner's corporation, the owner's corporation managers to manage, which is time consuming, adds to the costs, but unfortunately it's necessary. A further comment on the threshold for GST registration if the property is deriving any income from sales or rental of common property or generates income from fees which exceeds 75,000, then they're required to register for GST, even if the annual levies are below $150,000. That would be because they're running some sort of business. In terms of income tax, an owner's corporation is like any other company or trust within Australia. It's a registered entity. It's a legal entity, and it should have to lodge an income tax return. Fortunately, though, owners' corporations have special compliance rules. They are only required to lodge an income tax return if they receive any assessable income, even if it's $1, $2. But what is assessable income? For me and you, it would be salary, wages, fees for doing some sort of service. But for an owners' corporation, it's defined as non-mutual income. This includes interest on investments, bank accounts, term deposits, income from common property, for example, mobile phone towers, advertising signage, fees for issuing owner's corporation certificates, sale or rental of common property, fees for servicing lots. Non-mutual income obviously excludes levies or special fees and charges. The important question for, the important question then that must be thought of by the owner's corporation is whether it's worthwhile to derive this, this non-mutual income. 
Why? Because you have to do a tax return. You have to report to the tax office. More compliance, more work, more fees. So it's necessary, it's important that you do some sort of cost-benefit analysis. The important factors that should be included, one, the cost and time of getting a TFN, liaising with the tax office. Can be done by an accountant, can be done by the committee. Non-mutual income is taxed. It's taxed at 30%. So unlike, so, so unlike the fees, 30% is tax rate for non-mutual income. So that needs to be factored in when preparing budgets, that you're only going to be receiving 70% of the non-mutual income. And then finally, there is the need to prepare an income tax return. That is often done by an accountant, and we would obviously encourage as such. The benefit, it gets done right. And the added benefit is an owner's corporation gets a tax lodgement extension. If you're using an accountant, from October to the following May. So you get to keep your money for a little bit longer. That's a little selling point. <laughs> Single touch payroll is something which many people have heard about. It's actually be, it's been in for a couple of months. It actually becomes mandatory from Tuesday, the 1st of October. But it's one of the biggest changes to come into effect in recent years. Effectively, what single touch payroll is that every employer, be they be them large, small, or micro, is the definition, now have to report to the tax office each and every pay run disclosing wages, disclosing superannuation, paid to every employee. It's great for accounting software companies, Zero, Myob, who gather a wealth of new subscribers. And for those owners' corporations which have a building manager, be it part-time, full-time, they would have to comply with this added burden. An owners' corporation in that instance, if they had a single part-time building manager, they would be a micro-employer. So what does this mean? An owner's corporation who employs will need to lodge a single touch payroll report via their software, electronically, each pay run. There is concession available, which the ATO allows, which says you don't have to do it every pay run if you are a micro employer, meaning less than five employees. You don't have to do it every pay run, you can do it once a quarter. But you can't do it yourself. You have to get your accountant to lodge it for you electronically using their software. So either way, it's an added burden and added cost. So this, this is a huge project for the tax office, and compliance is mandatory. In terms of penalties, so Mark talked earlier about penalties from VCAT. The tax office isn't as generous. Their penalties for non-compliance on this issue is currently set at $210 per pay run per month outstanding. So if you pay someone fortnightly and you don't do it for a couple of months, you've quickly got a penalty of a couple of thousand dollars. So that's incentive to get on top of, get on top of this issue and ensure that it's, it's handled, in a, handled. So audit. So an audit is, is an examination and checking of the transactions by a person independent of the organisation. The key word is independent. So the purpose of an audit is to form a view as to whether the, whether the numbers and information in the report are accurate and whether the owners of the owners' corporation can rely on those financial statements. So there's a number of reasons why you would get audited. Firstly, the committee can agree. They can want one. They can choose to be audited. Secondly, if there's suspicion of mismanagement. And thirdly, if the owner's corporation is a prescribed owner's corporation. So under the current legislation, which we'll talk about the upcoming change, a prescribed owner's corporation consists of 100 lots or has ordinary levies in excess of $200,000 in a financial year. So as Mark spoke before, the owner's corporation other acts amendment bill is before parliament and could be introduced and effective at any point in the next two years. This changes the definition. The major change from an audit perspective is the five tiers. Tier one, tier two, which is 100 lots, 101, and 51 to 100, and tier, the smaller ones, three, four, and five. So tier one, an audit is required. Tier two, a review is required. 
So a review is different from an audit. An audit can be done, and that's, sub, that's up to the owner's corporation to decide. Same with tiers three, four, and five. An audit is always optional, but a review is somewhat different. An audit provides reasonable assurance that the users, sorry, reasonable assurance for the users that the financial statements are fair and true. A review is different. Similar to an audit, similar work is involved, but it provides a different conclusion. It basically says there is no reason that this does not present a true and fair view. A little bit less work involved, but it's an additional cost and an additional burden. So that's the major change from an audit perspective that the OC, that an owner's corporation, which has between 51 and 100 occupiable lots, now is to efficiently be able to prepare the financial statements under the Australian accounting standards and then arrange for these to undertake a review prior to the AGM, which, pre which previously may not have been the case. I'm not going to bore you any more with any more details on audits or specific audit issues. There's many and there's really cool stuff. <laughs> I think so anyway. But I think the important point to note is that any audit or any review should be seen as a positive. It's a, yes, it's an additional cost, but it should be seen as a benefit to the owner's corporation. Thank you.